Hello, I'm Nathan Crabb, and I'm editor of the Invading Sea website. The site is managed by Florida Atlantic University's Center for Environmental Studies and publishes news and commentary on how climate change is affecting Florida. Climate change, uh, there's growing bipartisan agreement on climate change in Florida, but the way we talk about climate change can create partisan divisions and make it harder to pass climate policy. In this panel discussion, we're going to be talking with conservatives about how we can better reach consensus on climate and energy issues. But first, let's hear from Colin Polsky, who's conducted regular polling at uh, Florida Atlantic on climate change. Colin, could you tell us about yourself and what your polling has shown about how Florida Republicans view this issue? Sure, Nate. I'm Colin Polsky. I'm a professor here at Florida Atlantic University, where I'm also the director of the new environment school called ECOS. I'm a climate social scientist by training, and what that means is I study and teach about how people create, perceive, and respond to climate challenges such as climate change. And when I moved here nine years ago, I had the sense that in Florida, and South Florida in particular, but Florida more broadly, that the uh, national partisan divide uh, on climate was uh, diminishing, maybe not evaporated, but it was less here, but I didn't have data. So we started about four or five years ago uh, conducting a statewide public opinion poll of Floridians about climate. And we have found that consistently, indeed, uh, Florida Republicans are uh, much more uh, in line with uh, Democrat as well as independent opinions on climate and climate change. And this seems to be a big difference from the national scene. And so perhaps Florida may be the first big red domino to fall. Uh, time will tell. But we're very happy to have here a former Congressman Bob Inglis. Um, and so I would like to pass it to him to hear his perspectives from having worked in the trenches. That's right. Uh, our next pan panelist is Bob Inglis. You know, as Colin said, he's a former congressman and, and now the executive director of Republican RepublicEN.org, a growing group of conservatives who promote free enterprise solutions to climate change. You know, Bob, you spent uh, two six year stints in Congress and uh, discussed how over that time uh, your views on climate change evolved. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience and maybe lessons others might learn from it? Yeah. So, you know, my first six years in Congress, I said that climate change is nonsense. I didn't know anything about it except that Al Gore was for it. <laughs> um, and uh, in as much as I represented Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina and the US Congress, a very conservative place, that was the end of the inquiry. Okay, I admit that's pretty ignorant, but that's the way it was my first six years in Congress. Um, then I was out of Congress six years doing commercial real estate law again in Greenville, South Carolina had the opportunity to run for the same seat again in 04. My son, who just turned 18, came to me in that race and said, uh, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. Uh, his four sisters agreed. His mother agreed. That's a new constituency. So uh, step one of a three-step metamorphosis. Step two was going to Antarctica and seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings with the House Science Committee. And then step three was another science committee trip and uh, something of a spiritual awakening, which seems improbable, right, on a godless science committee trip, because we all know that all scientists are godless. Um, apparently not, because this uh, Aussie climate scientist that I was snorkeling with was clearly worshiping God and what he was showing me as we snorkeled together. Um, and so... Uh, you know, St. Francis of Assisi supposedly said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Uh, so Scott Heron, who's now become a very dear friend, was uh, clearly preaching the gospel just without any words. Um, later, we had a chance to use words. And he told me about conservation changes he was making in his life to love God and love people. You know, rides his bike to work, does without air conditioning as much as possible in Townsville, Australia, a pretty hot place hangs the family's clothes out on the line, all to consciously love people coming after us. So I got right inspired. I want to be like Scott, loving God and loving people. So I came home and introduced the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act of 2009. Not good political timing to uh, introduce a carbon tax in the midst of the Great Recession. 
uh, when you represent the reddest district of the reddest state of the nation, yeah. um, in Republican runoff, I got 29% of the vote. The other guy got the other 71% of the vote. Rather spectacular face, face plant, you know? Usually don't yeah. do that badly unless you've been indicted. Now I hadn't been indicted. I was just on the <laughs> wrong side of Tea Party orthodoxy. So uh, there launched my climate career uh, rather than my congressional career. Well, and, and let's we'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. I appreciate um, you you relaying that uh, that experience for us. Um, you know, your, your climate career. You've done a lot of great work with Republican RepublicEN.org, uh, especially here in Florida. And someone else that's that's been involved with that work is uh, Mary Anna McC Mary Anna Mancuso, uh, who's a spokesperson for the group as well as a political strategist in South Florida. Um, you know, Mary Anna, tell us a little bit about how these climate issues are viewed by uh, conservatives here in Florida. You know, are, are the 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 threats the state's facing from things like sea level rise and extreme weather, do they affect the views of conservatives here as compared to other places? We can only hope that it helps move them a little bit closer to looking for a solution in Florida, as well as in the rest of the country, right? So I've had the pleasure of working with Bob for, well, a very long time. I don't want to date either one of us, Bob, so we'll just say a very long time. And it has been an absolute pleasure to work with Republic EN in the Sunshine State, as well as across the nation to help raise awareness of climate solutions. And when it comes to Florida, there's a real opportunity. Florida is ground zero for climate change. We're seeing this with the coral bleaching that's been happening. The hot, I mean, just the hottest summer that seems to have swept the nation. Canada's on fire. It's affecting the entire country. And here in Florida, we're really seeing a a lot of results that are coming as a result of climate crisis. When we think about home ownership and the fact that that is the American dream, one of the many that we have the ability to have in this country, the problem is, is that in Florida, homeowners insurance now is actually people are just pulling up roots. We have farmers and other large insurance companies that are saying they no longer will insure homes due to hurricanes, which at the time of the taping, there was a hurricane coming through the state. And I think that that's really important to look at when we think about the opportunity that is in Florida, not necessarily the problems, but looking at the opportunity that we have. And with Republic Ian and Bob and I, as well as other former congressmen in the Sunshine State and some elected officials currently to really make some headway to show the nation how we can actually have solutions and that only America has the ability to solve the climate change solution. Great. Well, thank you, Mary Anna. And uh, our, our final panelist here today um, is maybe you can tell us a little bit about how young conservatives in particular uh, view climate issues. Uh, Yanni uh, Soreas is a Florida State Director for uh, Florida Conservatives for Carbon Dividends, a group that aims to mobilize uh, young conservatives in support of what it calls pro-growth, pro-innovation solutions to climate change. Yanni, um, maybe tell us a little bit about kind of the generational ch differences in climate change and how the young Republicans that you work with on college campuses might view this issue differently, or do they view it differently than, than, than older conservatives? Absolutely, Nate. Thank you very much. And uh, Young Conservatives for Carbon Dividend certainly draws its, its strength uh, and its inspiration from uh, generations of Republican leaders that have come before us. Uh, we intend to restore the GOP's proud legacy of environmental stewardship and truly safeguard the only planet that we're blessed to call home. Uh, and that's ever more important here in Florida. Uh, I've worked on conservative causes since I was a teenage Republican knocking doors in the 2012 election. Um, and it's, it's, you know, since working with, with college Republicans, since uh, 2020, uh, it's clear to me that climate change has truly become uh, an incredibly polarized uh, issue. And uh, we, we, you know, when when you uh, when you go and you speak with uh, college students, especially college Republicans, they're constantly faced with a barrage of, well, Republicans don't do enough on climate change. They're they're constantly demonized on college campuses, and they don't really what they see from their leaders is they don't really have solutions. You know, where Republicans tend to be very good at saying no to the issue, uh, but up until recently, uh, they have never really come up with solutions of their own to to combat this. Uh, you know, the claim that the Democrats are the only ones that have solutions, I would say up, up until the last few years was was true. Uh, but uh, we're, here, we're here to we're here to reclaim that, it, it, you know, the, the GOP's longstanding uh, environmental legacy. Uh, and we're advocating for a restoration of American energy independence, as well as manufacturing. Um, and especially, you know, we I would say college Republicans and young Republicans uh, in general, uh, our generation's evil empire is China. The China knows that they can't beat us militarily, and so they seek to uh, they seek to undermine us economically. 
Uh, we, we see that in, in how they buy up agricultural and commercial real estate to the point where Republican representatives in, in the state legislature have had to pass a bill. And they flood our markets, more importantly, with dirty, cheap and inefficient goods that otherwise could be made in America by Americans. And that's really the a big issue that I would say college Republicans and young Republicans see is that they see our leaders uh, constantly demonizing American manufacturing on the other side. Uh, but they're not really coming up with solutions of their own and and, and looking outward uh, when, you know, looking at countries such as China and India that produce more carbon emissions than we do. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. And and you kind of mentioned some of the, the, the divisions and, and, and here in Florida, you know, climate change is kind of. Um, become another culture war issue, you know, and, and speaking of how um, there's a debate um, going on right now about how it should be um, taught in, in uh, public school classrooms. Uh, Colin, you've done some polling on on that issue of climate ed- education. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've found on 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 how Floridians view that. Well, definitely, Nate. So um, several years ago when we started this poll, it was clear to me that questions about the proper role of government in uh, preventing a certain cultural trends or um, encouraging them needed to be asked on the climate question. And, and we see that today with our current governor and his various policies that address what gets taught or not in K through 12, as well as in universities. And so on this climate question, I expected there to be a kind of similar partisan split as we see uh, on the question of what should we do with our schools on non-climate topics but I've not found that in the data. It seems that uh, Republicans are, along with independents and Democrats in the state, quite supportive of teaching about climate, climate change in our K through 12 schools. So I uh, originally thought it might be an outlier and needed to wait for more data to come in to you know, see if it was an outlier. Turns out it's pretty consistent. So, you know, well over half uh, in the 50s and in some of our waves and the 60 percent of Republicans uh, in Florida support teaching climate change in K through 12 schools. OK, well, Bob, g- getting back to you, you were you were starting to talk about, you know, how you're. Um, um experience um, with your re-election or, or uh, not getting re-election kind of led you to, to, to found uh, RepublicanEN.org. And and I guess I wonder um, how things have changed since then. You know, uh, uh, Yanni is obviously um, uh, uh, part of another group on the, I guess you guys call it the eco-right. And, and I guess I wonder, do you feel like um, there's been an evolution since since uh, since that happened, since your group was first formed in terms of other groups forming and there are more uh, conservative voices kind of speaking out on this issue? Yeah, it's really, it's quite different. You know, when I was getting tossed out of Congress, those were the darkest days of the Great Recession. It's it's completely different now. Um, and I, I think what we're seeing with Yanni and uh, Students for Carbon Dividends and all the other eco-right groups, the proliferation of the eco-right uh, indicates that um, there's real movement over there. Now, of course, the challenge is that there's an enormous environmental left in this country. It, it's, uh, it gets hundreds of millions of dollars every year. The eco-right gets a paucity of money. And uh, the results are pretty obvious, uh, you know, that, uh, well, you can't fly straight if you've got an enormous left wing and you got a teeny-weeny right wing. And so uh, people like Yanni and uh, Marianne and I are trying to expand this right wing and uh, make it so the bird can fly straight. You know, I mean, we really need to have this as a bipartisan uh, consensus because, um, you know, every piece of major environmental legislation in this country has been passed in a bipartisan way. Um, if you don't do it that way, then you run the risk uh, that uh, Obamacare proved, which is you you do it just on one side of the aisle, the pendulum swings, people try to undo it on the other way, you know, and so we can't do that on climate. We're way into this we don't have time to do, for example, what Australia did. Australia did a carbon tax, undid it, did it, undid it. Uh, we can't do that as the largest economy in the world. We've got to set policy and then stick to it. And the way to do that is to get bipartisan consensus. And I'm so encouraged by what I'm hearing here on this call from Colin about that polling, because I think that uh, that is what Marianne and Yanni and I, I think can testify to, yes, we deal with some activists and those are 
pretty hard situation sometimes because they are all wrapped up in the big old uh, cultural war or whatever. But you get beyond that sphere and into sort of more normal people that aren't thinking politics all the time. And you find that, uh, I mean, I'm just encouraged by Colin's data. Yeah. Uh, I think that's I think that's where the action is, is um, out there among those folks. That is encouraging, uh, you know, not to not to um, uh, bring a, a more depressing note to the to the exchange. But, you know, I do wonder, um, you know, with all that, you know, these new groups that you've mentioned kind of forming and everything like that, I guess I wonder how uh, how this issue has evolved politically speaking, though, in, in, in Florida, Mary Anna. I mean, you know, we have uh, the, the legislators supporting, you know, uh, coastal resilience funding and this sort of thing. But at the same respect, we have you know, the governor uh, vetoing uh, federal money for energy efficiency programs. So have the politics shifted here in, in Florida in terms of what you're seeing happening in, in the legislature and among our state officials? Slowly. To Colin's point in his polling data, what he's seeing is, as he mentioned, he thought at first that this was an anomaly, and it's not. It's actually a really great thing. We're seeing slowly with the Republicans moving toward wanting to find climate solutions, which I think is fantastic. There is nothing I love more than a group of political ideological right folks realizing that climate change is a problem and we have to find a solution. And I think that this is a turning of the tide. Now, as Bob can point to, as Yanni can point to, as Colin, as well as you, Nathan, can see, it takes a lot to make that shift. I mean, this is a generational shift. I think that there's a lot of excitement happening because Republicans are waking up to the reality that climate change does not care if you are Republican, if you are liberal, if you are Green Party, they don't, it doesn't care. At the end of the day, it is party agnostic and it is happening whether we are ready for it or not. And it's time to find those solutions. And I think that that's really fantastic as the Republicans are slowly trying to make that shift. And at the end of the day, there's a real opportunity for Republicans to actually claim the mantle and lead us into the 21st century. And I really hope that as time goes on, they begin to shift more toward finding those solutions because there is such an opportunity. Definitely, definitely. Yanni, I mean, you mentioned um, kind of talking about uh, climate change in, in uh, economic terms in terms of competitiveness with China and, and as something that resonates uh, with with conservatives. Tell us a little bit more about the kind of the issues and the, the language that you found resonate with uh, young conservatives on college campuses in, in, in regarding climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I would, you know, the the winning message, especially is, that, you know, mo most most conservatives, especially young conservatives, agree that climate is 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 important, uh, but they also agree that we can't enact climate policy at the expense of national or economic security. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to develop bipartisan solutions that 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 won't compromise these these issues. And I think many Republicans are are certainly seeing that uh, it's you know the GOP has a very unique opportunity. Uh, to win elections, and that it's not just good politics to talk talk about or engage on this issue, but it's good policy as well. Uh, and it's something that many conservatives in Florida have started to embrace. We, we you know we see we see in the governor's office, you know, creating the office of resiliency. We see a lot more resiliency me measures coming out. Uh, and I would even look, you know, looking to South Florida um, with uh, with the uh, the city of Miami with Mayor Suarez and and. Uh, Mayor uh, Mayor Lago in Coral Gables, uh, many many Republicans are are starting to discuss and 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 speak more on it. Um, with with young Republicans, you you know you look at you you look at some of the the more radical uh, policies that have been put forth by by the left. You look at the Green New Deal, uh, and I like to say that the Green New Deal is nine parts New Deal and and one part Green, uh, and it certainly resonates with with uh, with many Republicans as uh, in and as. Uh, as Bob noted, you know, re regular people that aren't aren't as as interested in politics, or it's you know, it's it's true that they they see these proposals come from the left, uh, and most of them just see it as a vehicle for a, a big government agenda that they want no part of, and that's really I think what has caused so much polarization uh, to the point where Republicans just simply don't want to engage on it. It's, they they feel that engaging with uh, with the left uh, and with moderate Democrats on this issue, will simply just put them at risk of uh, losing elections, or being called being called a rhino, or or just being seen as as you know just shifting too far left and and allowing the country to fall 
uh, to socialism or or to the left's big government agenda. So, uh, the, you know, the, uh, as, as many of the panelists have noted, the the more that Republicans are, and I, I would argue the Florida Republicans are environmental Republicans with the way that they've uh, been embracing it. And you look at alternative forms of energy as well, uh, you know, noting Congressman Byron Donald's doing excellent work on, on nuclear um, so it, you know, embrace talk, you know, the, when, when you discuss terms of how to win over, uh, conservatives, uh, you simply just talk to them about, about issues they already support pro-business, free markets, uh, unleashing American innovation and putting America first. You, you raise a lot of interesting points and, and, we, and, and uh, let's, uh, move on from the question and answer part of the, the discussion we have a little less than 10 minutes left and let's just have some discussion among us. So, yeah, as you said that there, there's a, a history of, of, of Republican involvement in environmental issues in Florida land conservation comes to mind as something that it's had a lot of Republican support, uh, over, over the years. Um, so what can, what, what, what are the, what's achievable here in Florida? I mean, what are the things that you think that Florida, Florida Republicans can get behind in terms of climate policy? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, a lot of, um, the folks on the left, uh, viewed DeSantis and in, in initially in terms of some of the steps he took in the environment very positively and have, have, have cooled on him, um, uh, since he ran for president, Marianne, what do, you, what do you think in terms of uh, what we can achieve here in Florida and what's the way to kind of bring uh, conservatives and, and, and uh, folks on the left together on, on solutions? As Yanni points out, that climate is a big voting issue for Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and they will really help push elected officials to find those solutions. However, at the end of the day, those generations have the opportunity to be innovators and to find the solutions themselves. And I think that when it comes to conservative values and it comes to being Republican and being part of the eco right, we don't look to big government to solve those solutions. There's great things such as a carbon tax and other things that elected officials can do well in office. But we want to look to the individual and we want to look to the free market to find those solutions. And these these guys, these voters, whether it's college Republicans or people postgraduate, post-college, they have the opportunity to find the solutions. And we're slowly starting to see various innovations come forward to offer that into the market. And I think that that's fantastic. And they will continue to drive the elected officials to make those changes. With regards to DeSantis, but, but let me stop you right there. Though Bob lost his seat, though, because of a carbon tax. So well, he lost think... it in two thousand nine. The times are a bit changed? different. Okay. Absolutely, I think there's a lot of opportunity and appetite for carbon tax, as well as so those types of solutions coming through Congress. However, it is not going to be the you know be all end all of that. That is not how we solve this problem. It is going to be a multi pronged approach. Whether it's carbon tax, we see that the president is currently looking to cut carbon emissions by 2050. And DeSantis had an opportunity when he came into the governor's mansion to be the Teddy Roosevelt of Florida. I was one of the massive advocates for him on the environment. However, he has let a lot of conservatives who are huge environmentalists down because he has abandoned the seat and the post to focus on other ventures. And I think that that's really unfortunate for Florida, especially as they see hurricane season gearing up, losing homeowners insurance and other opportunities where he could actually really weigh in if he wasn't so preoccupied with other endeavors. So what other panelists think about about that? Well, I, I certainly agree that it's uh, it, those are the bad times back in 2010 cycle, but uh, now things are quite different uh, because um, the things that are happening in Florida about these adaptations to the realities of climate change and the wake up call of the insurance rates, all of that means that Florida is poised to be a key state in calling the rest of the nation to action on climate change. Because, you know, there's three ways to fix climate change. You can regulate emissions. Problem with that, like in the Green New Deal, is you can't regulate Chinese emissions. So you're not solving climate change. Second, you can incentivize clean energy. Problem with that is you can't affect Chinese economics through the American tax code because they don't pay American taxes. So you might clean up local air, but you're not solving climate change. Third way to fix it, obviously the one I favor because I'm dissing one and two, is, uh, is to actually price in the negative effects of burning fossil fuels through simple accountability carbon tax paired with a reduction in existing taxes so there's no growth of government or a dividend of the money back from the carbon tax again so there's no growth of government and then the real kicker apply it to imports and win that case in the world trade organization and make it in china's interest to do what we're doing and then we do that 
8 billion people around the world start seeing the true cost of the burning of fossil fuels. It's built in the price of everything. And at that point, clean, which is renewable, appears cheaper on the shelf than dirty made accountable. And consumers in the liberty of enlightened self-interest start choosing the, the cleaner, which is just cheaper. And then you have this massive uh, innovation in the free enterprise system and free enterprise solves it. Um, and so we think this is the, uh, the, the most uh, exciting opportunity for conservatives to step forward with the solution. And, and by the way, the left needs some bucking up on this because they're not exactly sure they've got enough courage to talk what I just talked. <laughs> because they remember what happened in 1994 when Al Gore proposed a BTU tax and they lost the House for the first time in 40 years. Sure. And so, um, so they need a little bit of courage, a little shot of courage. Uh, and they need the, the certainty that Republicans are going to do this with them, hold hands and do it together and lead the world to solutions. So we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, Colin and Yanni, any comments that you'd like to add about that or any other issues before we close? I, I would love to um, add a little as well as to hear from Yanni. So I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, building on the congressman's comments and Mariana's, you know, it raises for me, and I, I admit I'm an academic, so this is maybe a, an academic question, but what what is bipartisanship? And, and I think that term, that concept will look different in different places. So for example, here we have a veto-proof uh, Republican majority these days in, in Florida. So it seems to me that legislation on climate could get passed as there's been things passed in, in recent years. Um, and it may not really be bipartisan in the sense that there needed to be um, compromise and discussion because the Republicans have the supermajority. And whereas in another state where there's a more of an even split, it may be that there needs to be some more um, in-depth conversations and reaching across the aisle and, and compromise. So having not been in a, an elected body myself, I don't know if that's accurate or not. But I, I do want to conclude by tipping my hat to um, the Republicans here in the legislature, which is probably a tag team effort with, with the governor. There's a, a committee now in both houses called uh, the Select Committee on Resiliency. Um, and of course, it's led by Republicans. And in my understanding those committees would not exist if it weren't uh, approved and endorsed by the Republican Party. So that's a big move forward and yeah. just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. And and Yanni, you get the last word. Any closing comments before we have to wrap up here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. As uh, as Bob noted, you know, it, uh, a, a domestic carbon price doesn't exactly uh, doesn't actually that doesn't address what's coming in from from foreign nations such as China. Uh, over the last 20 years, our uh, carbon emissions have gone down a little over 20%, uh, whereas uh, worldwide carbon emissions have still gone up. Uh, that's all the result of, of other nations. You know, we can we can constantly improve ourselves, but it doesn't really address the real problem, uh, which is carbon emissions coming in from, from other countries such as uh, China and India, China being our ideological enemies. Uh, so a, a border carbon adjustment or a foreign pollution fee, uh, whatever, whatever, you know, whoever decides to call it. Uh, would eventually we would hold communist China and other nations accountable for their pollution, and it would level the, more importantly level the playing field for our manufacturers. Uh, as a great selling point for conservatives, at the end of the day, we don't need to expand the scope of government to fix this problem. Uh, and I want to quote uh, President Reagan here: "There are simple answers to our nation's problems, and those are, are revenue neutral." Okay. Well, with that, that'll be our last word. I, uh, you know, there's a lot more to discuss on this, obviously, that you can fit, then you can fit in a 30 minute panel. So um, uh, the invading seat is the first of these discussions that we've held, but we hope to hold, hold a lot more in the future and, and continue these discussions. So we really appreciate everyone who participated in the panel today. And with that, uh, we thank you for, for viewing and uh, have a good one. Thanks.